Hello and welcome to Take from Caesar. My name is David Merlin. Nothing you'll hear me say is intended as legal advice. Anything that sounds like that to you, just consider it something somebody else might do on a planet far, far away where the law matters. It doesn't matter here. I prove it on a daily basis. Believe it. April 12th, 2020. Another day in paradise. Definitions of innocence. There can be many. Uh, depending on the statute under which one is charged, there could be a whole bunch of different contributing uh, elements, essential elements, that might make it really hard for the government to even prove that crime was committed. You want to know what the essential elements of a particular statute are if the government's throwing it about. And uh, clemency1.com is essentially a focus on a collective of convictions that uh, have the same underlying constitutional defects. They share these defects and they are fatal to the judgment. So why shouldn't they be pardoned, commuted? Why shouldn't their indictments be quashed? The criminal investigations against them be uh, shut down? Why not? Uh, they're innocent. If it's unconstitutional, the defendant is innocent. The Constitution is first. And clemency1.com is the actual innocence project beamed at placing in the spotlight the, uh, the facts against the IRS, the Department of Justice, and the courts relating to criminal charges. Uh, the government's got no business approaching the average individual with the uh, tax code and regulations. No business. No business whatsoever. Uh, because every contact violates the Fifth Amendment, due process. How did the law operate? In your conclusion, you have the authority to speak to me, servant. They can't even answer that. And we could stop and start, or start and stop, excuse me, with Section 83A of the tax code. It explains how to tax the entire workforce. And if you argue it in court, they'll penalize you thousands of dollars and they won't tell you how you're wrong. So, yeah, it's a hold in due process. And everyone under a tax indictment who only sold their labor, they are a false convict because for constitutional reasons, their conviction is void. That means they're innocent. That's one of the definitions of innocence. And what we're going to look at first, uh, this is an introduction to clemency1.com. And what we're going to look at first is a sentencing transcript from 2011, 2012, 2013, I can't remember. We'll see as the page is uh, scrolled. Where uh, plenty of legal arguments were made by these defendants, Mr. and Mrs. And uh, the judge says certain things about uh, the demeanor of the two defendants in this tax case the submissions by these two defendants in a tax case, how he's read all those submissions and he read the government's memorandum and then he comes to these conclusions about their demeanor. They seem like very nice people and they're sincere. I want you to listen to that because we're going to get to the definitions of innocence after this and I want you to hold in your mind uh, this two-page uh, two pages of reading that I'm going to do from this transcript. Uh, and this is the kind of target that I'm talking about. It's huge. They're obviously innocent in the judge's own words. And he sent them to prison. At the top of the uh, at line 13 of page 25 of 44, with regard to Jimmy Walden, defendant number one, this is the husband and wife, the court has read and I reviewed the pre-sentence investigation report prepared by the probation department in this case, except, and I accept and adopt that report, and I find that the correct total offense level as to Mr. Walden is 24. His correct criminal category, uh, history category is 1, and that the proper guideline provision would be a term of incarceration of a 51 to 63 months, enough to destroy somebody's life. With regard to Genevieve Walden, 
defendant number two. The court has read and reviewed the pre-sentence investigation report, and I accept and adopt that report. I find that her correct total offense level is 24, her correct criminal history category is 1, and the correct guideline range with regard to Ms. Walden would be a term of incarceration of 51 to 63 months. In addition, I have reviewed the materials that were submitted by Jimmy Walden, which include a document which he has entitled Notice of Conditional Acceptance of Pre-Sentence Investigation Report, and all of the attachments to that a document which he has entitled Notice of Foreign Record of Settlement and Conditional Acceptance and all of the attachments to that, a document that he has entitled Notice of Conditional Acceptance and Addendum to Pre-Sentence Investigation Report and all of the documents that he has attached to that. And I have further reviewed and I consider the document entitled Conditional Acceptance which, he has fi which was filed by Mr. Walden and Mrs. Walden. I consider it in each case uh, on July 23rd, 2013. With regard to Ms. Walden, uh, I have also reviewed the Notice of Conditional Acceptance of Pre-Sentence Investigation Report, which she filed. I have considered the document which she filed called Notice of Foreign Record of Settlement and Conditional Acceptance, and again, as I previously stated in her case, I have likewise reviewed the document entitled Conditional Acceptance Filed uh, July 23rd, 2013. This is the judge in the case at sentencing. In addition, in each case, both Miss Walden's case and Mr. Walden's case, I have reviewed the sentencing memorandum that was filed by the government, and I take that into account. Initially, let me say a few things. Mr. and Mrs. Walden, I find you to be pleasant people. I do not know what has led you down this road. I have observed you during the trial. I observed you at pre-trial. I have observed you here. I have read everything that you have filed. I don't know any other way to say it other than to say that what you have filed and the law that you attempt to rely on is nonsensical. It is not the law of this country. I recognize that you sincerely believe it. Don't forget that. It is not the law of the country uh, of this country. I recognize that you sincerely believe it, but you are wrong, and you are wrong-headed on it, and that is the reason that you were convicted and found guilty, each of you, for five felony counts of conviction under the superseding indictment that was filed. Okay. We don't need to go further. Um, uh, well, yeah, one paragraph more. Listen to this. I have heard what you have had to say here. It makes no sense, whether it makes sense to you or not. Really? Whether it makes sense to him or not. It doesn't make sense to the court. The government is correct when the government says that this case is being watched and there are Americans that are paying their taxes. In fact, I will go beyond that and say there are millions of Americans who don't particularly like the income tax and don't particular, uh, particularly like the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service has been involved in some controversy recently, but that in no way affects the obligations of Americans to pay what has been established by Congress as the appropriate taxes on their income. The jury was correct. Okay. Don't forget all of this. It's just a couple of pages. And uh, I, I know you. Uh, it, it is not the law of this country. I recognize that you sincerely believe it, but you are wrong. Okay. Definitions of innocence. <laughs> Welcome to clemency1.com. And by the way, uh, the best way to describe clemency1.com is that it is a grant application. I'm looking for grants that will uh, support me to take on this project of seeking clemency for an entire category of tax convict. The law is a secret. They won't even discuss the law in court. Three trips to the Supreme Court in 2018 alone. But in the last five years, a bunch of docket numbers, uh, a bunch of different civil actions you'll see uh, listed, not by docket number, on the homepage of clemency1.com. You can't have the law, they'll penalize you for asking. 
well, what are we doing here? If I have a right to the, the tax to be imposed by clear language, if I have a right to not be re, uh, required to speculate as to the meaning of penal statutes, if I have all these rights, why is there a single tax convict? Because you can't have those rights when you get to court. I'm going to go directly to the top of page 6. There's a particular right here that bears uh, reference. Let me see, top of page 5, excuse me. There it is. This is the umbrella of this entire document. The law has to reach me before the law can penalize me. Only the law can penalize me. Congress writes a law, and what they say penalizes me about that statute is the only thing that reaches me. The government's not allowed to find other things. Listen to what they say about due process. And this is footnote number one, U.S. versus Batchelder, Supreme Court, 1979. It is a fundamental tenet of due process that no one may be required at peril of life, liberty, or property to speculate as to the meaning of penal statutes. A criminal statute is therefore invalid if it fails to give a person of ordinary intelligence fair notice that his contemplated conduct is forbidden. That's pretty clear to me. Uh, here's another one, footnote 2, which is Williams versus U.S., 1951. Criminal statutes must have an ascertainable standard of guilt or they fall for vagueness. How do I comply with this law? Well, it's a secret. We aren't going to talk about it, even though it explains how to tax your paycheck. All that's left is speculation. There is no ascertainable standard of guilt. But when you go to court on these and you prove with statute that the tax code's being misenforced, all bets are off. All this precedent is meaningless. Footnote number three, U.S. versus National Dairy Corp., 1963. Void for vagueness simply means that criminal responsibility should not attach where one could not reasonably understand that his contemplated conduct is proscribed or prohibited. How about that? Where's that standard when I get to court on all this and I still go to prison when the law is a secret? I've seen it and I've seen it and I've seen it. I've talked to victims. I've talked to people that are under indictment. I've talked to people that were only under IRS criminal investigation. You can still stop an investigation. I can still nullify a tax grand jury. Not every time. But I've done it by presenting the law. But once they get the indictment, they steamroll and uh, you're ground zero. They get plea agreements out of everybody by saying, we're going to indict your spouse too. That's the way it's played. Uh, thank you, Uncle Sam. And there's nothing different in state proceedings. It's what prosecutors do. They know you're innocent. They know the, the, the conviction would be unconstitutional. And they get it anyway by threatening to do the same thing to your spouse. That's a prosecutor. Any questions? So there's this huge target out there uh, called a lack of due process. And all of this in this document, it's only 11 pages, is an expression of due process. What does the government have to do to assure that I had due process rights in the trial, in the, the proceedings they brought against me? This is an overturned conviction, Ninth Circuit, 1999, the case of or, uh, U.S. versus Orduno Aguilera. There is sufficient evidence to support a conviction if, viewing the evidence in light most favorable to the prosecution, any rational judge, trier of fact, could have found the essential elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Because Orduno Aguilera properly preserved this issue by making a motion for an acquittal after the close of all evidence, evidence, this court's standard of review is the same as that of the district court's denial of that motion. In the decision, because this fact is a necessary element of the statutory definition of anabolic steroids, he was charged with peddling anabolic steroids illegally. But in the definition, it said it has to be a substance that claims to enhance performance. 
and this guy's product did not claim to enhance performance. So because uh, this fact is a necessary element of statutory definitions, uh, which is in turn a necessary element of the offense, failure to offer this evidence resulted in insufficient evidence to sustain, uh, sustain the jury's verdict. They just missed the guy, and his conviction was overturned. Ninth Circuit, 2000, case of Estrada Macias. This was the instance of a uh, methamphetamine manufacturing enterprise. I think it was in a house, and there was a uh, travel trailer beside the house, and Estrada Macias lived in the travel trailer. But the conspiracy was inside the house. And the only thing they found in the trailer that linked Estrada to the conspiracy to manufacture and distribute methamphetamine was a list on a piece of paper that said this person owes that much for how much meth, this other person owes us this much for how much meth. And his conviction was overturned. No rational trier of fact could have found that this standard was met for Estrada. The record was barren of evidence that he participated in the conspiracy. Even though Estrada initi initially denied living in the trailer, his denial was as consistent with non-participating knowledge of the crime as it was with complicity in the crime. When there is an innocent explanation for a defendant's conduct as well as one that suggests that the defendant was engaged in wrongdoing, the government must provide uh, produce evidence that would allow a rational jury to conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that the latter explanation is the correct one. So when you put an innocent explanation on the record, it shifts the burden of proof, and the government has to prove to the jury that, oh no, it's, uh, he intended to break the law. They have to prove the latter. Um, suggest the defendant was engaged in wrongdoing. The government has to meet that. Because this guy's conviction was overturned. Ninth Circuit, 2007. Uh, I think this was Ninth Circuit, pretty sure. This guy, <laughs> he lived in Mexico and wanted to visit relatives in the United States. And a relative of his, a cousin I think it was, said, uh, hey, you can go ahead and drive my van to the U.S. So he drives the van to the U.S. Uh, the van gets intercepted and they find a bumper made of cocaine. Oops. And uh, they said the record looks like all he did was uh, accept a van to drive to relatives. He didn't know what the van was made of, and so his conviction was overturned. Unlike Herrera-Gonzalez, a different case, the government has presented no evidence whatsoever that contradicts Esquivel's story or that indicates his intentional participation in the conspiracy. The government has emphasized that Esquivel must have known about the conspiracy, but it has failed to point to any evidence that supports the conviction. Our criminal justice system is not based solely on inferences and assumptions. There must be evidence sufficient to sustain the conviction, and here the record is barren of evidence that Esquivel participated in the conspiracy. The government has presented no evidence that establishes Esquivel's knowledge or possession of the cocaine and no evidence of his participation in the conspiracy. His convictions for possession with intent to distribute and for conspiracy to distribute drugs accordingly are reversed. That's a definition of innocence, isn't it? Well, his conviction was reversed. That means he was innocent. And there's a definition right there that has to do with the evidence doesn't have to do with whether or not he actually knew of the conspiracy. It has to do with whether or not the government could prove it. I don't like defending guilty people. There's a lot of innocent uh, people out there that need help of an advocate. However, when you know somebody's case should be dismissed and their constitutional rights were violated, like in those as in those decisions, uh, you fight for the truth first. So... This is California case. I'm not going to attempt that last name. 2001, the Federal Constitution's Fifth Amendment right to due process, the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial, made applicable to the states through the 14th Amendment, require the prosecution to prove to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt 
every element of the crime. That means if they don't prove one particular element, that's the definition of innocence. See how when you, when you take just the phrase, definitions of innocence, definition of innocence, and you look at why the government lost cases, from that, like it or not, you might not realize it when you first read it, but that's a definition of innocence. Innocence is no conviction. There. Isn't that easy? No conviction. Innocence. Innocent person has no conviction. A person whose case is overturned has no conviction. Innocence. Staying out of prison. That's what I'm after, is to help people stay out of prison. The uh, Kind of like the opposite of the tax honesty movement. California case. Appellate, 1995. Uh, the prosecution bears the burden of proving all elements of the offense charged and must persuade the fact finder beyond a reasonable doubt of the facts necessary to establish each of those elements. The U.S. Supreme Court has extended this right to constitutionally require that no jury instructions relieve the prosecution of the responsibility of proving each element beyond a reasonable doubt. And criminal intent is always an element. Don't forget that. Uh, in 1989, U.S. Supreme Court held jury instructions relieving states of this burden, uh, proving each element, violate a defendant's due process rights. Such directions subvert the presumption of innocence accorded to accused persons and also invade the truth-finding task assigned solely to juries in criminal cases. Hear ye, hear ye. So, you look for definitions of innocence in case law, uh, of which you can't read too much. Every case like this is a set of uh, lessons directly from judges and justices. And so, read case law. Lots of it. Let's see. A plea of guilty entered by one fully aware of the uh, direct consequences of the plea is voluntary in a constitutional sense unless induced by threats, misrepresentation, or perhaps by promises that are by their nature improper as having no proper relationship to the prosecutor's business. Where a defendant has procedurally defaulted a claim, like a statute of limitations, you can't file that anymore because you waited too long, you waited more than two years, or whatever. Where a defendant has procedurally defaulted a claim, the claim may be raised in habeas only if the defendant can first demonstrate either cause or actual prejudice, or that he is actually innocent. Actual Innocence Project, clemency1.com. When you argue that you're actually innocent, innocent, you're entitled to a hearing. Petitioner's claim may still be reviewed in this collateral, collateral proceeding if he can establish that the constitutional error in his plea colloquy has probably resulted in the conviction of one who is actually innocent. Murray versus Carrier. This is one of the benchmark cases for um, pleading actual innocence, keeping open the courthouse doors. Suggested reading, of course. Um, let's see. That uh, guarantees that no one will be deprived of life, liberty, without due process of law. And the sixth, that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. We have held that these provisions require criminal convictions to rest upon a jury determination that the defendant is guilty of every element of the crime with which he is charged, beyond a reasonable doubt. Every element. Don't forget that. This is about if you don't meet the statutory definition of a term, then the statutes to which that definition applies won't reach you. Thus, Congress did not reach every transaction in which an investor actually relies on the inside information. A person avoids liability if he does not meet the statutory definition of an insider, as in this instance. But if you don't meet the definition of the term person, if you don't meet the definition of the term citizen, if you don't meet the definition of the term employee, whatever. There's all these definitions in the tax code that raise only questions, and uh, the government won't talk about them beyond uh, penalizing you for asking. Here's another great definition of innocence. 
A tax must be imposed by clear and unequivocal language. Where the construction of a tax law is doubtful, the doubt is to be resolved in favor of whom upon which the tax is sought to be laid. All these Supreme Court cases and this circuit case, I like this one. In this one, the Eighth Circuit Appellate Court says, as judges, the party, we look at these parties and they have vastly differing interpretations of the same statute. Here's what we have to do as judges. And when I confront the judiciary with, excuse me, here's what you're supposed to do as judges, because all my arguments under the tax code are statutory, they run from them, and this means nothing. So don't believe for a minute you'll get anywhere uh, with all this precedent if you went to an American court. And we have where we started here, top of page five. It's a fundamental tenet of due process that you can't be required to speculate. It has to give a person of ordinary intelligence fair notice. It is settled that when the law is vague or highly debatable, a defendant actually or imputedly, that means actually or just accused, lacks the requisite intent to violate it. So even if you're convicted, if you go back and you say, excuse me, but the law is vague or highly debatable, you fit in, this is a tax evasion case, U.S. versus Kreitzer, Fourth Circuit 74. And all these cases cite Kreitzer and quote Kreitzer, where it says, if the law is vague or highly debatable, a defendant can't have criminal intent. That's kind of like a definition of innocence. And so you make the argument that the law is vague or highly debatable. In my case, I can make the argument, excuse me, i got a bunch of docket numbers that show it's off limits. The law is off limits, it's frivolous, it's without merit, and they aren't going to talk about it, and so I can't figure out how to comply with it, and they still send me to prison. Type of argument. Here's another one. To punish a person for doing what the law plainly permits is a due process violation of the most basic sort. Why is there even a question? The answer is, the judiciary is corrupt. All this precedent is evidence of a right to due process. The prosecution knows all about this. The courts know all about this. That makes it a conspiracy when they ignore precedent to put you in prison. That's a felony. Conspiracy against rights. 18 U.S.C. 241. And they do it anyway. So you can't go to courts. And that's why this is a clemency effort. You can approach this president. He's pardoning guilty people that were treated unfairly. I got an idea. Look at all these people. A very easy uh, to understand concept of going to bat for all employees or self-employed contractors who only sold their labor and ended up with a tax conviction or indictment. All of them. Zip one executive order. Nothing should happen to them because the government can't even explain the law. A credible claim of actual innocence is the strongest equitable claim on the prisoner's side. See Lee v. Lampert, Ninth Circuit, 2011. <laughs> Citing a Supreme Court case from 93. This is... Ruth Bader Ginsburg's separate concurring opinion in a 2013, 2011 Supreme Court decision against the government. So I'm arguing all this time that the law is unconstitutional. Nobody can figure it out. The government won't uh, disclose its operation. They don't have an interpretation for relevant statutes. So all of this is a claim that the law and the enforcement is unconstitutional. Listen to what she says about that. An offense created by an unconstitutional law, the court has held, is not a crime. And she cites an 1880s case. A conviction under such a law is not merely erroneous, but it is illegal and void and cannot be a legal cause of imprisonment. If a law is invalid as applied to the criminal defendant's conduct, the defendant is entitled to go free. That's the target phrase right there for clemency1.com. That's exactly what I'm shopping for. And they cite a couple page, uh, cases and quote them. And she goes on, In short, a law beyond the power of Congress, that means a law that offends the Constitution maybe, 
A law beyond the power of uh, Congress for any reason is no law at all. The validity of Bond's conviction depends upon whether the Constitution permits Congress to enact this statute. Her claim that it does not must be considered and decided on the merits. Bond was a chemical engineer. She discovered that her husband had cheated on her and took caustic substances and applied them to the front doorknob of the lady's home, the car door handle, and the mailbox handle, I believe, and was prosecuted under a federal statute that was intended to implement a treaty barring the use of chemical weapons during warfare. And her argument was the Tenth Amendment says the state has jurisdiction over such a crime. It's a local crime. And you're really overreached with this in violation of the Tenth Amendment. And that was the claim that was heard by the uh, the court in this case. But this dissenting or this uh, separate concurring opinion had a very definitive point to make about what is a void judgment. If it's unconstitutional, it's history. And you're you're encouraged to read every case I cite. I read them. True threats. This is a statute, er, the threat statutes, not just one of them. It's like 18 U.S.C. 800 to 880, maybe. Uh, 860 to 880. Uh, true threats encompass those statements where the speaker means to communicate a serious expression of an intent to commit an act of unlawful violence, not an intent to make you so unpopular that other people would commit acts of un, uh, unlawful violence. It has to be a first-person threat. Uh, directs threat to a person or a group of persons with the intent of placing the victim in fear of bodily harm or death in first-person context. Harm or death committed by me if I'm the person uttering what they call a threat. An intent to commit an act of unlawful violence. So what, it, what did the person threaten? Did they say that they themselves were going to do it or that they would cause others to do it? Which one is it? Because that makes all the difference as to whether or not you, uh, you're guilty under the threat statutes. And that would include, I think it's 879, a threat against a presidential candidate or their family or a past or a former president. I can't remember. Uh, things you got to know. You really do because they throw that word threat around like it was party favor. And this is a 2001 case Lowell B. Kraft brought to my attention. Thank you. About uh, clear language. And here the Supreme Court cites a state court case, which, uh, not that it's peculiar, but they didn't have to. So the, uh, the expression is, if the law is vague, the taxpayer wins. I agree with the court uh, that the Internal Revenue Code provision and the corresponding Treasury regulations that control consolidated filings are best interpreted as requiring a single entity approach in calculating product liability loss. I write separately, however, because I respectfully disagree with the dissents. This is a ma majority opinion. I respectfully disagree with the dissent suggestion that when a provision of the code and the corresponding regulations are ambiguous, this court should defer to the government's interpretation. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? The government argue, or the, uh, the dissent said we should go with the government where it's unclear. There's a whole bunch of precedent that says otherwise. We've already been over it. At a bare minimum, in cases such as this one, in which the complex statutory and regulatory scheme lends itself to any number of interpretations, we should be inclined to rely on the traditional canon that construes revenue-raising laws against their drafter. That means in favor of the citizen. And they cite a 1911 case out of uh, the Southwest Reporter, Missouri. Um, when the tax gatherer puts his finger on the citizen, he must also put his finger on the law permitting it. What a novel concept. 1923, U.S. v. Merriam. If the words are doubtful, the doubt must be resolved against the government and in favor of the taxpayer. 
In 1927, Supreme Court, the provision is part of a taxing statute and such laws are to be interpreted liberally in favor of the taxpayers. You can't have any of this when you go to court. And yet, it is your right to due process. You can't have it. If, you, if there's a right that you have, and when you get to court, you can't have it, it's a crime. Because the government knows, the prosecutor knows, and the judge knows. That makes it a conspiracy against your rights to due process. It's a felony. And for these purposes, uh, more on point, it's grounds for clemency. Because there's a defect in the conviction that's constitutional. And no one should lose rights to bear arms and the rest of it that comes along with a felony conviction. Uh... It's not right, it's not due process to bear the weight of that when in fact the government didn't do its job. That's the argument being made. This is an excerpt from the Department of Justice's own trial memorandum in 2014, Anchorage, Alaska, where they'll tell you their own definition of citizen. Uh, excuse me, their own definition of innocence. My mistake. Won't happen again. And in this, uh, during this, I'd like you to recall what we saw in that transcript. I know you sincerely believe this, but it's nonsensical. Uh, now i got to make sense when you give me a 22-pound tax code and regulations printed on rice paper. And that's the paperback version. And that's not 2020 or 2019. That's 1993. 22 pounds. Rice paper paperback version and they don't have to talk about it <sighs> my goodness this is James Back he was an Alieska pipeline engineer in Alaska making 125,000 per year thereabouts 10 grand a month and laid it all on the line when he filed six Pete Hendrickson tax returns cracking the code um Enough said about that guy. The indictment charges the defendant with three counts of making and subscribing a materially false tax return in violation of 7206. In order for the defendant to be found guilty of that charge, the government must prove, and this is a specific jury instruction about 7206, false tax returns. Uh, let's see. Third, the government must prove must prove in filing a tax return the defendant acted willfully which is having a legal duty to file failing to perform or uh, knowing and believing that he had the duty and failed to perform the duty and here it's about having to file a form that's accurate this is a ninth circuit model criminal jury instruction that's ninth circuit west coast False information is, is material if it had the nature or uh, a natural tendency to influence or was capable of influencing or affecting the ability of the IRS to audit or verify the accuracy of the tax return. The fact that an individual's name is signed to a return statement or other document shall be prima facie evidence uh, for all purposes that the return statement or other was signed by him. So what? Uh, let's see. The indictment is also... The defendant is also in charge in the indictment with four counts of willful failure to file a tax return. He filed a tax return. It was a Pete Hendrickson tax return. They can't talk about the tax return, and so they jumped over it to say he filed, failed to file one. In order for the defendant to be found guilty of that charge, the government must prove each of the following elements. First, that he was required to file a return. How did Section 83 operate in your conclusion his compensation was gross income? They can't even talk about it. Second, the defendant to file, uh, failed to file an income tax return by the due date. That's easy enough to prove. Third, in failing to do so, he acted willfully. That means there is a legal duty, he knew of the duty, and failed to perform the duty. They can't do that. In any case, they simply get the indictment by lying to the grand jury and then steamroll. In order to prove that the defendant acted willfully, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant knew federal tax law imposed a duty on him and the defendant intentionally and voluntarily violated that duty. He filed tax returns under penalties of perjury. 
How is that not evidence that he believed he was in compliance with the law? How is it not evidence that he believed he was in compliance with the law? We're reading a jury instruction. 9.42 a defendant who acts on a good faith misunderstanding. Remember the transcript. I know you're sincere in your belief, but you're going to prison, pal. Listen to this. A defendant who acts on a good faith misunderstanding as to the requirements of the law does not willfully, uh, but does not act willfully, even if his understanding of the law is wrong or unreasonable. A defendant who acts on a good faith misunderstanding as to the requirements of the law does not act willfully. That means he does not have criminal intent, even if his understanding of the law is wrong or unreasonable or nonsensical. That's interchangeable right there for these uh, purposes. Nevertheless, merely disagreeing with the law does not constitute good faith mis misunderstanding of the law because all persons have a duty to obey the law whether or not they agree with it. Thus, in order to prove that the defendant acted willfully, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not have a good faith belief that he was complying with the law. Now I'm going to tell you something about the judge in that case, in the sentencing transcript. In February or March of 2005, Jim Walden contacted me. That transcript is from 2013. Jim Walden contacted me and said uh, they're heating me up with the W-4 form and uh, threat of criminal investigation. Got any ideas? And I said, you want to sue them? Because I know questions they can't answer. He goes, yeah. So he filed in U.S. District Court an action to perpetuate testimony under Rule 27 which says, I don't have a claim for damages yet, but there's a controversy brewing, and I need to open up a docket number, so I have discovery rights. And uh, he presented his arguments. The government asked the court for a protective order against the arguments, and the court issued a protective order against the government having to answer those questions. That was exhibit number one, in the New Year's of 06 congressional criminal complaint that I filed with several other complainants. He was one of the original co-complainants. And that was Exhibit 1. It was the horse I rode in on to 80 members of Congress. 180 pages all told with exhibits, 58-page memorandum, 33-page criminal complaint, 12-page notarized cover letter, and a table of authorities, table of contents, uh, there was an abstract of primary claims, so just 180 pages all told, 80 members of Congress, cost me almost $6,000 to do it. This man, Jim Walden, was one of the uh, co-complainants. And then when he, when he had sued in 2005, uh, his judge was Lee Yeekel there in Texas the same judge that tried him and sentenced him in 2013. That judge was named in the caption of my criminal complaint as a defendant for his conduct against Jim Walden, issuing the protective order against Jim Walden accessing the law. It gets a lot more tightly knit, doesn't it, looking at that uh, transcript now. In 2005, he sued that judge, and that judge issued, or, I'm sorry, he, he sued, and that judge on the case issued a protective order against the government. And then, New Year's of 06, he named that judge, under penalties of perjury, in my criminal complaint, as a felon for what he did. And then in 2013, that judge tried and convicted him. Don't get near me with a claim that the judiciary is not corrupt. <laughs> Just don't try it. So even if it's unreasonable, you're innocent. Nonsensical, unreasonable. For these purposes, same, same. This is still the government talking. <clears throat> 
Section 7203, that's failure to uh, file, and 7206, filing false documents of the Internal Revenue Code, use the term willfully. The Supreme Court set forth, uh, set forth the following definition in Cheek v. U.S. Willfulness, as construed by our prior decisions in criminal tax cases, requires the government to prove that the law imposed a duty on the defendant. They can't do that. I'm the one that argues affirmatively using only tax statutes. Everybody else has some other project or theory, a fanta a fantasy or delusion, requires the government to prove that the law imposed a duty on the defendant, that the defendant knew of this duty, and that he voluntarily and intentionally violated the duty. This same definition applies equally to all tax offenses, misdemeanors and felonies alike. All tax offenses. In other words, if you know that you owe taxes and you do not pay them, you acted willfully. And this is just a circuit case. They left out what if the what about the law has to impose the duty? They just say, in other words, if you know that you owe the taxes, well, how do you know that? The law's a secret. And so they jump right over it and put it into two different criteria. Then you've acted willfully. It's a three prong test. In a failure to file tax return prosecution, the government is not required to prove an intent to evade or defeat a tax, but may instead prove an intent to disobey or disregard the law, uh, which may be the intent to not file a tax return rather than the intent to defeat, a defeat or evade a tax. So what? A defendant's views regarding the validity of tax statute, uh, a defendant's views is... That should be R, A-R-E. The defendant's views regarding the validity of a tax statute is irrelevant to the issue of willfulness and, if heard, the jury should be uh, told to disregard. Willfulness is a state of mind that may be established by evidence of fraudulent acts. Well, they have to have a duty. You can't get around that with their fraudulent acts. You have to prove they had a duty. And you have to prove they intended to break the law. You have to watch these people with every syllable. I've, by the October term of 1998, I had written five clients all the way to the Supreme Court. In 2018, three more to the Supreme Court. Proof of willfulness in a criminal case tax in a criminal tax case may be and usually is shown by circumstantial evidence alone. What about lawful evidence that they owe a duty? proof of willfulness you have to have a legal duty to believe in and they just jumped over it again in a circuit court case not a Supreme Court case <laughs> again you have to watch him at every turn a defendant's past tax paying history is admissible to prove willfulness circumstantially no it's admissible to try to prove uh, just providing it doesn't prove anything you still have to make the argument and so, uh, there's the end of the excerpt of this uh, particular memorandum. When you get to court on these authorities, you'll find only judges who care not. All tax-related decisions concerning these standards of interpretation and of fairness were written before the formulation of my 1994 treatise, which proposes only statutory challenges under controlling provisions. And that's why they have to disregard all precedent when they go up against my conclusions because the law is first well now we can't talk about it now that you've proven the law actually protects you because we've had our way from the complexities of the tax code for so long we can't bear a challenge of this nature and so we're not going to talk about it and we're going to penalize you for asking and you'll probably go to prison however when you beat the government using just the tax code you quickly expose the judiciary as the tax man's personal property and the law comes in last this leaves only clemency as a viable route to vanquishing a false conviction under these authorities, which cuts the IRS, DOJ, and the courts out of the equation. Explain the law or put the handcuffs away. Treat us like Americans. Speculation is all that's left. Boom. Due process violation. It's not imposed by clear language. Due process violation. I can't be forced to speculate. Due process violation. Where the law is vague or highly debatable. Due process violation. 
And remember what Ruth Bader Ginsburg said in uh, uh, U.S. versus Bond. Let's uh, scroll back to that. It's something else. Here it is. A conviction under such a law is not merely erroneous, but it is illegal and void and cannot be a legal cause of imprisonment, citing an 1880 case. If a law is invalid as applied to the criminal defendant's conduct, the defendant is entitled to go free. It's not good enough for the courts. And so clemency is the only route that's left. Period. There's nothing else available. It has to be clemency. Because it's a different branch of government dishing out the justice. And it's actually against the uh, Department of Justice and the courts. They've perpetrated all this. How can you go to the courts and argue against the Department of Justice and expect any judge justice when they're the ones that did this to you? I don't have a tax conviction, so I have nothing to gain in this effort. It's a project I'd like to take up. And I'm looking for grants that will support me right up to the election this year. Uh, six, seven months so I can make a press campaign out of it. Uh, advertising, uh, publish portions of it. Uh, publicity, publicity, publicity to make it really unpopular to be an IRS agent. And we have a president that hates unfairness and he doesn't like the IRS. I have it on good authority. So uh, the time is now to exploit this president's realistic view of clemency. It's the first time I can recall. Uh, there's so many things different about this president that uh, I don't know how anyone could even really even compare him to other presidents. And the two come together in the fact I've proven that the law is a secret. I'm the only one that argues the tax code the way I argue it, and I'm the only one that uh, causes criminal investigations to close down and tax grand juries to not render indictments. There's nobody that can do that using just the tax code. So, and no one's gone to court in abundance of times in the last five years to show that the law is a secret. So there really is nobody else for this job. And clemency1.com is a grant application to the public at large. Support me in this effort and I'll get a responsible, uh, well-crafted and uh, well-stated presentation together to place in front of the president that needs merely unfairness as a great reason to grant a pardon, to grant commutation. When I can prove, excuse me, this is innocence. The definitions of innocence, when you look at what can constitute innocence and you look at what tax convictions uh, pose to the individual, no one can figure out the law. The sacrifices I had to make, the hours I worked reading the tax code, reading case law, I was a slave to it for years. And you can't expect anybody to have to take that part of their life to understand the law and yet you got all this great precedent that says if an average individual can't understand the law he wins so it's a huge target and it's a great opportunity for the fact that clemency authority is being wielded with realism rather than uh, politics <laughs> or or whatever it was in the past it's different now so clemency1.com is that project actual innocence for these reasons, it's unconstitutional. They got no business indicting an American under law they can't even explain. My name is David Merlin. This has been Definitions of Innocence, an introduction to clemency1.com. None of it's legal advice. I'll see you in the next tutorial.